cast your mind back to a time when you were able to plug a game console into the living room on the enormous sized anvil heavy CRT screen. Sure, from time to time you got to play all of your favourite games on this setup, but let's be honest, the real reason why this was in here was so that your dad, the man of the house, could have a go on one of his favourite games. Yeah, okay, playing Streets of Rage or maybe Golden Axe was some of the more fun shared experiences, but when it was just him, alone with a cup of tea brewed, a lit cigarette in the ashtray, slippers on and a single stinky armchair facing dead straight and centre to the wood grain covered entertainment unit, for him and him alone, nothing came close to Desert Strike. It's big boy time today guys on Slope's Game Room, because at the time, during the early to mid noughties in the Slope household, this scenario was far too common. Because of this, at the age of about 6 or so, Desert Strike didn't grab me straight away. However, with only a small cartridge collection to hand at the time, once I had defeated Jafar for the 50th time, found all the collectibles in Micro Machines and came to the very real realisation that my borrowed copy of Taz was actually a bit of a crap game, I too picked up the big boy grown up game myself and ever since then I have been completely hooked onto the Strike series. Desert Strike, Jungle Strike, Urban Strike, Soviet Strike and Nuclear Strike. Sure I had my favourites and least favourites throughout this franchise but all in all I had fun with every single entry and by the sounds of it you guys did too. Since the beginning of creating the Complete History Show, you people have been asking me to cover the abandoned but not forgotten Strike series. And for good reason. It's a series that broke the mould for what was expected from cartridge based consoles for the time. It was a series that would quickly become EA's most popular franchise outside of sporting games and this is the best part, even the later games are actually good. A solid series of titles that gets the blood pumping, a franchise that helps you grow as a gamer, a series that shouldn't have done well considering its competition, yet it sold bucket loads for the time. And today I plan to take you all back to the beginning as I look into its origins, find out who almost single handedly created these games, what games never got made, what games did then got renamed into something completely different, what tragic events did this game unfortunately predict and of course we're going to be trying to find out exactly why EA refused to bring this awesome series back to life and what the fans are doing about it. This is the complete history of the Strike series, desert, jungle, urban, Soviet, nuclear and everything in between. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Hey guys, I just want to say a massive thanks for you guys to actually click on this video and watch it. I love making these videos, I just want to say a big, big thanks. Please do hit that subscribe button and the notification bell if you want to be notified on when future videos like these are uploaded. And if you want to support the show and see videos like these early, including the next four or five kick scammer videos before they go public, you can do so by becoming a Patreon or YouTube member. Or if you want to support the show and buy video games at the same time, there'll be a Play Asia link link in that top comment with my suggested game of the week. Anyway, let's carry on with the video. Our story starts back in 1974 at the University of California at Berkeley where a young Mike Persane had just earned himself a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science and a PhD in Mechanical Engineering as well as another Masters of Science and Electrical Engineering of Computer Science, something he'd already been working towards for the last decade. After graduating, he took a position at Lawrence Livermore National Lab to develop mini computer systems for environmental testing before starting his own company in 1977, developing models of personal computers. He did this after working on different software packages in his spare time such as Datebook, Milestone and Visi Schedule. And as this company grew and grew selling this software via a mail order model in the Byte magazine, it was only a matter of time before a bigger and badder company took note and that bigger and badder company was EA. 
Electronic Arts were looking for a new product to release in order to take on Broader Brune's print shop. And as Mike was currently working on his own personal information management software himself, EA bought the company and released it under the title Get Organized, aka Go. Unfortunately for both EA and Mike, this software didn't sell all that well. So, in true Electronic Arts fashion, they bought the company and fired all of the employees. But never fear, as his next piece of software, Deluxe Video for the Amiga, was in fact a big seller, which not only earned everyone involved a big old bucket of cash, but more importantly, it earned Mike respect from this big publishing giant. And of course, that was a good thing because Mike had decided to push all of his formulaic software packages behind him and instead look to EA's entertainment division. He had already been working on his own crude flight simulation software called Fly for IBM, but after they dropped the idea, he went back to EA and after having a chat with Trip Hawkins, the founder of EA, they decided to take that software with a little bit of inspiration from the excellent Choplifter release for the Apple II, primarily the ability to save hostages. He got to work fusing the two styles together using his old Matchbox toys as inspiration and he did all of this on his own for an entire year year before his partner in crime, John Manley, joined the project. I was a member of a production group that was starting to develop games for a new PC platform that IBM was prototyping, and one of our first efforts was a flight simulator game project, but when the team decided to support the Sega Genesis console instead, this early prototype was quickly retooled into an isometric game with an omnidirectional scrolling playfield. John was brought on to be the creative force behind the plot. His job was to add the fun elements to a game that could have very easily become yet another boring flight simulation, but on a 16-bit system, which, let's be honest, nobody wanted to play. Beirut Breakdown was the name they went for during development due to the constant news coverage of the war in Lebanon, something that was quite different for the time, especially on home consoles. And the team decided to further push away from the norm of home console gaming by making the game not only set with a third-person perspective to the player, but to also give that player first-person perspective controls. Of course, they received a fair bit of backlash for doing this exact thing, but both Mike and John stood firm on their decision. The most important thing to me was the feel of the game. I wanted Fly in the Copter to be fun and satisfying, and I think I did a pretty good job. There is a lot of real physics involved, plus a novel way of moving the camera. I like the third person point of view looking down on the copter, and first person controls, as if you were in the cockpit. I stubbornly refused the insistence of some EA producers to have third person controls. Thankfully for the very small team, they had Stuart Bond behind them, the producer on this particular game, who helped them along the way, not only to make this game, but to also stand their corner when making these rather oddball choices. However, in a Retro Gamer interview, it was stated that he did implement a third-person control system just to get it through the gates, and as soon as it was, he took it away. On top of this, Mike and his small team decided that the open world setting would be the best approach for this series. To be honest, I had never been a game player and therefore wasn't constrained by the linear nature of most gameplay. I just thought it was more natural to be able to roam freely through a world. This was hearsay at Electronic Arts and I fought my battles with other producers. However, Stuart Bond, my producer, stuck with me and we got it approved. Over the next year, the small team, with the help of Tim Calvin, a practicing dentist, created the 3D models based on those childhood Matchbox memories, using Micro Machines as yet another sign of inspiration, which resulted in the game being released in March of 1992 in the West and the following year in Japan. Upon release, the game was part of EA's Air Force series, and obviously it changed its name to Desert Strike, or to be more specific, Desert Strike Return to the Gulf, which actually caused quite a bit of controversy. Being that this was the time of the Gulf War, of course, plenty of people actually believed that this game was glorifying these horrific events. But as Mike said himself, Of course, we all knew a bit about Saddam Hussein so Iraq was on our minds too. 
but the Gulf War was just a coincidence. Of course, these disputes and the fact that some veterans apparently burned copies of the game in protest did nothing but raise awareness for the new IP with this strange level layout and control scheme, which of course was a good thing as it got mostly great reviews across the board. Sure, nowadays it's a little flawed getting overshadowed by its follow-ups, but what we have here is an awesome little game that set the groundwork for what would come next in the series. The excellent intro fuels you up, influenced by other great intros for the system, most notably Revenge of Shinobis. And after the excellent Mega Drive rendition of the pumping title screen, the excellent cutscenes continue on showing some pretty disturbing imagery for a six or seven year old to see, and we are introduced to a Middle Eastern madman with nuclear missiles under his belt whose insane plans may just cause worldwide destruction and he ain't taking no crap from anybody. Thankfully, the government has put the best chopper team on the case and you are controlling that chopper. Surprisingly, as extreme as that intro is and as awesome as the front cover is, the gameplay is actually quite different. You expect Thunderblade type gameplay, but what you actually get is a strategic isometric exploration game where you constantly need to keep an eye on your resources. Of course, I'm not actually selling it all that well, but for anyone that's watching who has played it, you will instantly understand just how addictive this style of gameplay is. For me, I see Desert Strike as the perfect junior step for getting into more typical RTS type games for the time such as Command and Conquer and Empire Earth. You have your map, you have your objective, and you can complete those objectives however you see fit. It really does set the player up nicely as some of those earlier missions are not necessarily asked of you in later missions, but by completing them anyway, they will ease up your difficulty and give you the advantage over the enemy. These missions never feel boring, they're familiar and simple enough for you to get to grips with instantly, but exciting enough for you to want to see what happens next. This was apparently due to Mike and John watching tons of CNN action flicks during development to get inspiration for missions to give the player that were fantastic yet probable from a gameplay point of view. The game gained pretty much positive reviews across the board and was yet again another reason for EA to flex their muscles as it was at the time the most successful franchise for the company that wasn't a sports release. The game got a crazy amount of ports due to its popularity, none of which were done by or even had Mike involved at all, and even though the majority will argue that the Amiga was the best version to get, and for good reason to be fair, even Amiga World gave it a 100% A rating score and had the following to say. Forget what you may have seen on the Genesis and Super NES, Desert Strike Return to the Gulf on the Amiga is an experience all its own. This white knuckle arcader is even more over the top than earlier console conversions like John Madden Football and Road Rash. It's the sort of game that should make kart gamers turn green, and it's one of the best Amiga games ever. For me, even though the Mega Drive and Genesis version is obviously the best version to play, you can't deny the amazing efforts gone in by the team that ported the Master System and Game Boy releases. It was outstanding. Stripped back, yes, but the gameplay is fully intact with these titles, and then some. The name Desert Strike itself came from the realization that, well, you probably can't call this thing Beirut Breakdown, can you? Because of that, whilst brainstorming, Mike came up with the idea to call it Desert Strike instead because the name just works, in case they ever make a sequel. Think about it. Desert, jungle, urban, and yes, these were his predictions during the development of this title. And yes, jungle and urban just so happens to come up next. Sega TV! Terrorism. On tonight's show, we expose the South American drug barons. This one! This is another one! <clears throat> okay, over to our jungle correspondent. Up on their trail. Oh, looks like we lost him. Okay, here's Jungle Strike. Fight the drug battles from Washington to South America from the safety of your own home. I mean, it's good day, Sega! Jungle Strike was simply more of the same. Emphasis on the more. They took what made the original so great, what those reviewers were raving about, what those gamers were raving about, and simply multiplied it. 
You had four levels in the original, and now you have ten, each looking completely different, and each offering up new mission objectives that really did change up the gameplay style, and then some. The same way New Age gamers may decide to simply screw the mission at hand or GTA styly, the same can be done here. If you want to shoot up an insane amount of historic monuments, and heck, why not do the ultimate naughty naughty and terminate the president whilst you're at it? You can indeed do so. For the time, the game gave you so much freedom for a 16-bit title, and it was yet again completely unheard of to this level. Each level was designed by printing off these enormous maps and then filling them up with smaller pieces of paper of isometric buildings and working out the missions based around it. You had several different vehicles too to help break up the gameplay that although do not feel as awesome as destroying everything in sight with an Apache helicopter, do what they need to do and that is to break up the gameplay of EA's first ever 2 megabit cartridge. Yet again the game sold incredibly well, even more so in fact, and many people, including Mike himself, look at Jungle Strike, the second entry, as the best of the entire franchise. Of course a little bit of negative press surrounding the game's questionable themes did nothing but build up its reputation as a game that everybody wanted to play. The way Mike and his team saw it is that the Strike series, or at least the earlier games in the series, are actually peace games. Games where you have to stop the war from happening by getting in there early. And let's face it, it wasn't actually doing anything that the movies were not doing right. Not even with the questionably acted intro sequence on the PC port that's so low budget it even makes those cheesy Command & Conquer cutscenes Oscar worthy by comparison. Very impressive. As I have said, I still have nuclear resources. So you can't deliver the components to my jungle fortress? Within 72 hours. Destroying Washington DC will teach the Americans to stay out of my business operations. Finally, they will suffer greatly for the trouble they have caused us. <laughs> Of course, with yet another huge hit on their hands, EA didn't stop there. They got straight into production with the third game in the series, Urban Strike. Obviously set in an urban setting, if you guys were a little bit disturbed with some of the events and themes of the first two games, well unfortunately, retrospectively, some of the events in this third game did raise a few eyebrows. Most notably, the destruction of the Twin Towers. Welcome to Urban Strike, the Sega Mega Drive, from Electronic Arts. Unfortunate coincidences to historic tragic events aside, the game itself yet again pushes the boundaries of what you can do with this series. It throws new weapons and vehicles your way, including the experimental ground units. I mean, come on, this was set in the future year of 2001 on the Mega Drive and even 2006 on the Super Nintendo Game Boy and Game Gear releases. However, the biggest change up to the release was the on-foot sections that I never actually thought were too bad at the time. However, in more recent years, I have found them to be a little dull and annoying. Something you have to get through before you get back to the awesome basics. By this point, the Strike series was more than an established name, and just like before, this game sold well. Sadly, the review did take a little bit of a hit, mostly due to people not enjoying those on-foot sections and finding the gameplay too similar to what came before, and to be fair, they have a point, even Mike himself wasn't the biggest fan of these additions. I didn't like the on-foot parts, nor did I like the stealth fighter. I just didn't feel they fitted in well with the ethos of the original game. However, looking back, it's a great little trilogy of games that fit nicely on the home consoles and of course the first two on the Amiga. 
they stand as their own little piece of history, as everything after this not only changed up the formula a fair bit, which was definitely needed, but the original team were very much in the background from here on out. 32-bit strike as it was known during development on Trip's very own 3DO system was taking a fair amount of time to complete. Mike continued to help the team on the project for about a year, but as this had grown into such a gargantuan project, his time working on the game actually ended right about the time when EA realized that the 3DO wasn't the best choice and of course ended up porting over their hard work to the far more popular PlayStation. Of course, that game would eventually become Soviet Strike, the first proper game that Mike himself felt that EA sort of lost what made the originals so great. For me, however, it was one of those moments of Wow, look what they've done with the Incredible Strike series, in a good way. Sure, when looking back retrospectively, you can see that the 16-bit titles have actually aged better than the PlayStation 1 game, but still, for the time, this was nothing but a good thing. the Pentagon's response to hardliner aggression against the democratic government in Russia. We're taking no action. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the president wants to make it clear that the United States military is not and will not get involved in internal Soviet matters. We've heard reports of a covert military unit in the area. Can you confirm this? Trust me, we are not involved. Soviet strike. Mr. Secretary, what's the country's position on hostilities in the Soviet Union? Regardless of the issue, the president will not get involved in the local problems of the Soviet Union. Stop the war before it begins. The change-up of the camera angle and added music as well as the massive jumping quality for the cutscenes made the game feel like a next-gen game. Thankfully, the core of what made the original so great is intact here. You need to constantly keep an eye on your resources and your armor while strafing around the bad guys and picking up as many hostages and fuel as possible along the way. As computer and video games Steve Key put it, The Strike games are one of my all-time favorite series of games. They were original, tough and immensely playable and lay wasted hours of my younger years. And pill me in as all over the floor with a sidewinder missile if this one isn't going to do exactly the same. The most immediate thing you notice is that the feel of the game hasn't changed at all. Just a few tweaks here and there but this is classic Strike stuff. Superb graphics, spot effects and sounds all add to the highly polished pages. Friends, go and buy this now, or don't ever say you're a games player again. <laughs> Alright mate, of course he ended up giving the game a perfect high five out of five, and although not everyone shared his enthusiasm, I gotta say that the team at EA, again, in my opinion, did in fact bring what made those originals so great and implemented the core of the Strike series into this new game, and they didn't stop with just that title, as of course, Nuclear Strike was put into production pretty much straight away. However, another game was also in production. If you was good enough to complete the final game in the series Nuclear Strike, you was teased with this. Yes, Future Strike was the game that actually was being worked on at the same time as Nuclear Strike. However, this game wasn't going to be a strike game to begin with, but instead a follow-on from EA's Shockwave series. But as that series wasn't as hot as this series, EA decided to slap a strike logo onto it in order to get a trailer made for the end of the nuclear game. Of course, the idea of this game was to be set in the future and to make your Apache helicopter turn into a warlike mech, because heck, why not? Thankfully, the Shockwave crew were unable, or some believe, to have been unwilling to get the flying elements to work just right, and therefore the strike name ended up getting removed, as did the Shockwave name, and in the end, resulted in Future Cop LAPD. Now guys, I don't want to spend too long on this one, but what I will say is that Future Cop LAPD is a brilliant sort of spin-off to the Strike series. 
where the nuclear strike game was very much Soviet strike 1.5. For most people, Future Cop kind of felt like it offered a little bit more. At its core, it felt like the same kind of game. It was top down, it heavily relied on strafing, and you had plenty of missions that the Strike series had already glorified over the years. Thankfully, the simple change up of gliding and morphing into mech changed the formula up enough to make this its own game. Nuclear Strike, on the other hand, was still great fun, and technically, I suppose that that too gave variety with its changeable vehicles once again. But Future Cop was different enough to make it stand out from the well established formula. For me, at least, it is the better game. Sadly, because it didn't have a big name attached to it, it did review well, but it didn't sell all that well. Nuclear Strike, though, with its improved visuals and frame rate, did sell very well, and was even picked up by THQ for the release on the N64, where it continued to receive above average reviews across the board. Plans for nuclear weapons are on the internet. Parts can be easily purchased on the black market. Stolen radioactive materials are currently under investigation. Terrorists can make the bomb. The question is, can we stop them? It really was a fun game and basically took what made the previous game so good and polished it. Of course, that's not a bad thing, it's just a little bit extra for fans of the original. Similar to how the 16-bit titles were presented, it showed me that this was the best that they could do with the formula for the time on the PlayStation 1. Hey, you like this? Then you're probably going to like some more, right? Nuclear Strike is pretty much every possible way, besides its story, the ultimate 3D strike game, released in 1997 to reviews that were still good, just slightly downgraded due to its similarity, and that's it. <laughs> what? What happened here? Normally on the Complete History series, you normally get a couple of games towards the end of a series that do quite badly and that signals the end for that particular franchise. However, in this franchise, every single game was above average. Even that spin-off game was above average. But they just stopped making the games. Sure, EA did file two new trademarks back in 2013 with Desert Strike, which got fans excited for a remake or possibly even a new game. However, nothing ever happened. Why? Well, I guess we'll never know. Obviously, 2.7 million copies sold was just not enough for EA to want to continue this, and honestly, that figure would have been higher. If they ever released that trilogy collection for the Mega CD, aka Sega CD, which was never released, and of course, the early concept of yet another game called Future Cop, which was actually going to be the final game in the series for the Mega Drive, was also made. Yes, a different Future Cop than the one that was teased at the end of Nuke was at one point in very, very early ages of production, as Tony Barnes leaked in a Retro Gamer interview. All was going well. We were doing experiments, rendering all of the assets, a la Donkey Kong Country, and they were looking good when confusion over platform kicked in. In the US, there was still a market for 16-bit titles, but Japan and the UK were more interested in 32-bit stuff, so the project was mothballed. And here we are again, up against that big old brick wall. Hit after hit after hit, and then... Nothing, other than a few fan homages to the classics such as Alligator Strike, which actually does look pretty impressive, I might add. But for fans of the original Strike series, I'm sad to say that it doesn't look like EA or Mike are interested in bringing this series back. I think that would be cool. I still like the isometric third-person point of view. I really like the graphics look of some of the tribute games people have created. I did it when one person could write an entire game. Nowadays, it takes a large team to create a game. I don't think I would like the meetings. Hey there, guys. Thank you all for checking out the Strike series, The Complete History. Uh, <laughs> 
desert, jungle, urban, Soviet, nuclear, and everything in between. Yes, uh, this one, I've really enjoyed making this. It's, it's good to revisit these games that you know you haven't played in quite some time. Um, you know, these games haven't aged brilliantly well, but um, I still had fun playing them. It all took me back to when I used to play these games quite a lot, and then uh, I finally grew up and played games like these. Um, so yeah, it's really cool. And I discovered that my copy of Desert Strike is actually, and I had no idea about this, it's the American copy. I've got the Genesis release of the uh, of Desert Strike. Didn't even know that. But yes, thank you all so much for checking out the video. This is the part of the video where I'd like to give a massive shout out to all of my Patreons and YouTube members with an extra big a special shout out going to Aaron Gorman, Andrew Dalton, Arista, Benjamin Guy, Big Rico, Bram Perez, Brandon Gold, <coughs> Cheshire One, sorry, Chris the Shapeshifter, Christopher Devero, Clan Bob, uh, Kobo4747, Conrad Constantine, Cramilla, De Action Saxon, Daniel Terrares, Daniel, uh, sorry, Darren Watson, Dina, Dina81, Diggs B, Francesco Courts, Game Apologist, Gary Pinkett, Harvey2478, Hmm, Intrigued Gaming, Jay is Manchild, Jabba Al Aiden, Jacob P, aka Avalon James, Jeremy Rodriguez, Jonathan Hayward, Josh G uh, Gibbons, King Link Reviews, Lucas Softel, Lips, Man of God 9000, Man Shovel, Matt Jackson, Michael Ridley Dash, Michael Towns, Mike Fallon, Mind of the Unsane, Nerdy Simmer Tatty, Nicholas Burton, and Nick Pollard, uh, Night Will, Pretendo 64, Roll VP, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Rich. Richard Aldrich, Rocket Plod, Roven Army, Ryan Holt, Samuel Nielsen, Shade Silent, Shadow Dragon, Solox Captor, Stephen, Taylor Rain, Walter, That Gamer, The Cunning Linguist, The Shaded J, Tim Labonte, Tim Lund, Trans Rights, Vike Echo, Wiki Studios, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Hamburglar. Like I said earlier on in the video, guys, if you want to see what I'm working on early, be um, uh, access to all of the uh, exclusive rooms in Discord and see the next four or five uh, kick scammer videos early, then of course you can do so by becoming a Patreon or YouTube member for as little as you wish. But until next time guys, this is DJ Slope signing out and hopefully I'll see you all uh, next time. Much love, bye bye.